one of the biggest names in British show business. Knighted by the Queen and by the Pope. A cross between a saint and a national treasure. The marathon man who raised so much for charity that a hospital gave him his own set of keys. You've got a picture of a predator, a sexual predator who operated at will over decades. Behind his playboy image, 50 years of child abuse and hundreds of victims. It was evil, pure and simple. Now, for the first time, we reveal clues that were there 25 years ago, but were ignored. It's a no-go area, and I don't grasp on nobody. And the moments Savile's mask slipped. No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. His words and actions, examined by experts in body language, linguistics, and forensic psychology. The Watcher. At this point, Savile brings out the banana again. Why do this? It takes the attention away from the core of the question in tactics. The Listener. We have more glimpses of a man who's actually telling us things we should have taken seriously. And The Profiler. Jimmy Savile was able to groom not just individual victims, but in actual fact, the whole nation. I tell lies when it suits me. For five decades, Jimmy Savile was one of the brightest stars in the country. It is impossible for people now to realise how big he was. He was the biggest thing on British television. He was a cross between a saint and a national treasure. Flamboyant and unmistakable, and the face of BBC's iconic Top of the Pops. Jimmy Savile! Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome indeed to Top of the Pops. And how First presenter, Jimmy, Jimmy Savile, Newsday 1964. Top of the Pops, how about that one? He realised that it would be in his interest to get noticed, so he started developing his personality. He dyes hair a different colour every week. He was awarded his own primetime series. In this interview, he vividly recalled how it all began. I was walking down the corridor at Television Centre and the legendary Bill Cotton and he said, you've been fixing things for people all your life. Let's put some pictures to it and we'll make a show. And I said, OK, we'll call it Jim will fix it. He literally was the person who could grant children's wishes. He was this larger-than-life character who everybody around treated as though he was somebody special. When the government and the BBC needed someone to front a campaign for road safety, it was called Clunk Click Every Trip, they got Savile to do it. It's very likely that 400 of you will be injured in your cars tomorrow. Because he was the most trusted and admired and respected person in Britain. Clunk the car door, click the seat belt, even if you are just going round the corner, clunk click every trip. For loads of kids, you know, you hear people say Jimmy Savile was part of my childhood. He was certainly part of mine. I used to love watching Jim Will Fix It. I wrote to him because I wanted to meet Kermit the Frog and I believed that he was the man that could make it happen. It's amazing. How were we not all terrified as children by this man who is creepy looking, quite frankly? And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to some more Super Jim Will Fix It. And away from the TV studio, Savile was helping others. He was the great do-gooder. He raised millions for charity. How on earth do you raise £10 million in three years? He had real power and real influence. His friends, and we're talking proper friends, included Mrs Thatcher, he used to spend Christmas with the Thatchers at Chequers. The Pope, he got an honorary papal knighthood. He was good friends with her and him, as he called them, Charles and Di. He was even called in to try and mediate in their divorce. Prince Charles wrote him a letter. I'm often asked how to describe you. Are you my unofficial health advisor, a trusted confidant, or indeed simply a friend? The answer, of course, to Jimmy, is all of these and more. No one will ever know the full extent of what you have done for this country, and no one's more grateful than I. With affectionate greeting, Charles, the Prince of Wales. But behind this smokescreen lurked the full extent of Jimmy Savile's deception. I don't think that Jimmy Savile had some great altruistic interest in charity work. He was very careful to pick and choose what charity events he took part in. It was only the very high-profile stuff that he liked. So he's not doing it 
for them, he's doing it for him. The tragic irony is that that was a cover for all his activities and it gave him extraordinary access to lots of vulnerable young girls and boys. The statistics on Savile's offending are staggering. The word prolific doesn't do it justice. The earliest allegation, 1955, the most recent one was 2009. So he offended for decades. And remember, these are just the reported offences. One of the first women to report Savile was Cat Ward. Aged 14, she attended an approved school for girls. I was quite horrified when I reached the gates of Duncroft, which said, Duncroft, Home Office approved school for intelligent but emotionally disturbed girls. Believing entertainment would be good for the girls, the headmistress had invited in Jimmy Savile. He'd bring boxes of the, the latest top 10 records and cigarettes, makeup, perfume, all the things that teenage girls would like. And he'd take us for a ride in his swanky Rolls-Royce car. And then the one he wanted to spend some time with would be invited to come and sit with their ice cream in the front. And that's when he'd get a, a, an attack of wandering hands or, or worse. They recorded 214 crimes against Savile. And these included over 124 indecent assaults and up to 32 rape or penetration offences. And I think you can comfortably multiply that by a factor of 10 because many people we know will not come forward. So you've got a picture of a predator, a sexual predator who operated at will over decades. And yet Savile got away with it, even when he volunteered the most obvious clues. I'm odd, you're different. That's not a bad double. Between us, we should be able to do something. Question notice, the or not is omitted. How do they know whether I am or not? How does anybody know whether I am? Nobody knows whether I am or not. The focus is more on being a paedophile than it is not being a paedophile. How does anybody know whether I am? Fortune definitely favours the brave, and when you are brazen enough to actually mention the unmentionable yourself, then you take control of that narrative and you're in charge of that situation. The idea of using a metaphor to do with Hunt is interesting because it not only points to witch hunt, but it sets up this idea of a predator. That puts a lot of salacious tabloid people off the hunt. So the idea that he's the person who's putting other people off the hunt is that he's actually engaged in some activities that he needs to keep from the salacious tabloid people. So he implies that there's, there's a reason why they would want to tarnish his reputation. So he's making us feel sympathetic towards him and he's just misleading us because he knows that in actual fact there's real grounds for these tabloid rumours. Six months earlier, in 1999 on Have I Got News For You, Savile dared the sharpest and wittiest, leaving them lost for words. You used to be a wrestler, didn't you? Uh, I still you? am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. So this is edgy. This is risky. Uh, this is a ferocious environment. This, this program, he doesn't take prisoners, and he's going straight in with I'm feared by every girl's school in the country. And uh, we call this telling the truth falsely, that if you actually exaggerate something so much, it can mask it being a lie. So he's hiding in plain sight, and the audience are thinking this is all part of a showmanship, and actually he's telling us about things that are true. Lots of girls at that point who had been his victims were fearful of him. It's a double bluff. We think it's funny because we think that he's poking fun at himself because he's probably quite harmless and benign and probably doesn't have an awful lot of luck or interest in sexual pursuits. But that's not the case here, is it? But he's the only one who knows that. So in hindsight, what he's saying isn't very funny at all. I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. <laughs> Savile hides behind a facade of the zany DJ, the wacky great British eccentric. So people know that he's a little bit odd. They've come to expect that from him, but that's his appeal. They think that underneath it, he's essentially really quite harmless. 
So it's the facade that's not just about entertaining people, that might be part of it, it's far more about controlling people. Away from Savile's public image, there were dark rumours about his private life. One little-known late-night interview in 1995, presented by a serious journalist, tried to scratch away at the truth. Good evening and welcome. Sir James Savile OBE, the man who has single-handedly raised more than £30 million pounds for charity. The Faking It team study an encounter that probed Savile's secret life further than ever and tested him to the limit. He's very confident going into this interview. He's expecting some quite difficult questions about his personal life, which I'm sure he'd rather not answer, but he knows that he's got the smoke and mirrors in place. Well, what we can see as behaviourists is underneath that, you'll see signals of anxiety when he's scared and we'll see what he's thinking and feeling from his face and his body. This is someone, because he had a persona to hide behind, because he was well known for that persona, because he played the absurd character, he could be outrageous. He's able to manipulate language to have multiple meanings. He has tactics that work for him. Very manipulative character. Andrew Neil wanted to know why. Despite his Playboy DJ image, Savile didn't have any girlfriends. But when he pressed for an answer, Savile had come prepared. But yeah. have you had lots of female I would hope so, because being alive a long time, I would have hoped that one would have had lots and lots of them. But we're not asking for names, we're oh. just asking for the general principle. Oh, so I mean... We just I mean, want to know if you live this sort well, of playboy say... life of the DJ. Yeah, give or take, a few nice ladies. I mean, what a use of a banana in order to avoid questions about his sex life. Why have a banana prepared in your pocket and bring the banana out and uh, eat it? Because he knew he would get some difficult phases in the interview. And therefore, having some props handy uh, would help him to counter that and get the audience engaged again, get them on, it, on his side. People don't normally go on to a set, have an interview, and while they're being asked questions, start eating, let alone start eating something like a banana and all the phallic symbols it might represent. But this is Jimmy Savile doing control. Now, Andrew Neil is a very well-respected interviewer, but there's a subtle pulling of rank there. As soon as the banana comes out, the question that he's been asked actually leaves the mind of the audience. It's a way of going, look, look over there. But we're not asking for names, we're oh. just asking for the general principle. Oh, so I mean... We just I mean, want to know if you live this sort well, of playboy say... life of the DJ. Yeah, give or take, a uh, few nice ladies. <laughs> this is a guy who absolutely understood TV and understood that, you know, you, you could be asked the most difficult question in the world, but if you do something stupid, like peel a banana, you can get them off your back, get the audience laughing, and the interviewer has to move on, and it's the interviewer who looks stupid. If Andrew Neil then says, after he's peeled a banana, no, come on, you know, what happened? It, it, it's too late, the moment's gone. All my mother ever told me was not to eat while I was talking, but that was another <laughs> issue. Um, Bananas weren't around in those days. <laughs> you have to take into account that this is the 90s, Comedy was not very sophisticated at that time. So all that people really needed from Savile was a little bit of now then, now then. The way that he looks, lots of oohs and ahs and interaction with the audience and seemingly a comedy banana. And what he's actually doing is he's putting something in his mouth where the words should be, so he's not having to answer the question directly. But it, is it just a facade? Or the, the, yes. the, the play by image? Yes. Yes, or, is that, very... or is that answer part of the facade? No, no, <laughs> you, can't, you can't win here. <laughs> <laughs> Go, uh, it's all part of the facade, and uh, 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 I am very boring. Thank God. Throughout, it was a struggle between Andrew Neil, determined to find out more, and Savile, resisting exposure. But sometimes Savile couldn't help himself. No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. It's a different class, you see. Women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. Different class, you see. He's making a distinction between women and girls. Now, if we pick up on this distinction, he prefers girls who we assume aren't women yet, who are young enough to be more malleable and more manipulated by him. 
No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. It's a different class, you see. If we take that as its uh, pure definition, is a, a young female adult, and uh, that might get him into the territory of uh, below 16. Now, maybe that's a Freudian slip. And from his behaviour, we see no evidence that he's aware that he's tripped up there and slipped. We have more glimpses of a man who's actually telling us things we should have listened to and we should have taken seriously. Unfortunately, though, because he's making light of himself, he's poking fun at himself, we're more likely to expect it to have um, a simple, innocent meaning and not the darker meaning that we can attribute it now. Well, I've gone through life being a sex symbol. And... While Savile tried to make light of his dark secrets... <laughs> She's laughing. A lifelong friend, Charles Halligan from Leeds, dropped a potentially damaging hint. He's always had a knife for the ladies. Um, young ones as well. When I say young, I mean, you know, the proper age. 16 upwards. It's almost like he does a self-correction at this point, which itself is interesting. When I say young, I mean, you know, the proper age. 16 upwards. Why did he feel the need to make sure that young ones meant 16 and over? And another friend went even further naming a woman Savile knew and the hotel location where they'd met. Being a DJ, of course, didn't just bring you fame, it brought you girls, lots of girls. Did it? Well, I think it did. Well, Goodbye. Least, you nice said it did. You. We spoke Goodbye. to a long-time friend of yours... Did you? ..who knows about these things. Oh. Bunny Lewis. Oh, Here yes. he is. Yes. His friend comes on the screen. I think that friend knows something incriminating about Savile. <laughs> Funny little hotel tucked away up, not that far from Tottenham Court Road, where Jim used to go. And we'd sometimes have a bit of fun around there if we'd been involved in a programme together. And uh, we had a few friends there, one in particular, Jim might remember, called Norma. Now, he's a quick thinker. He's a member of Mensa. He's a smart character. And he's just had this, uh, probably a surprise, sprung on him. So he's now got to work out how do I react to this. Called Norma. What we've just seen is a series of five rapid blinks. But when we see a rapid blink rate, that shows that he's thinking hard. Psychologists call this cognitive load. And then what comes next is a counterattack. Well, Sir Jim, I think I would like to ask you about Norma. Tell us. I don't mind getting Bunny off the hook because he's married. <laughs> Now, then his, his girlfriend was called Norma. <laughs> and he has now fixed it for me to get him off the hook with his missus. Now, that's a very clear message to the friend, and it's quite an intimidating message. It says, you mess with me and I'll mess with you. I can cause trouble for you. So even though it's, you know, it's witty banter as far as the audience are concerned, probably not that funny for the friend. <laughs> And he has now fixed it for me to get him off the hook with his missus. He's playing with his language, using his own catchphrase and using blame shifting. Norma, a lovely girl. I'm the friendest idea who she was. So you don't remember <laughs> Norma? Speaking through the corner of his mouth and talks about Norma being a lovely girl. I'm the friendest idea who she was. Which is interesting in itself, because it's quite negative, isn't it, about Norma? She's not memorable. It's someone he can't recall which is interesting if we link it to the fact that she could potentially have been a victim. And he's therefore disregarding his victims. He's parodying them almost. But he's doing it in such a way that the audience are, are lapping this up and really enjoying the moment with him. And it wasn't Bunny's girl at all. He has never been unfaithful in his entire life. It was me... <laughs> uh, it was me who was beastly with... What, what do they call her again? Norma. Norma, Norma. So we have him almost pretending that he, he doesn't even know her name, having used her name several times. We have an admission, potentially, that he was beastly with her, which leads us to ask, well, was she a victim? During the interview, the truth was often close to the surface, and Savile couldn't stop himself from revealing it. Why have you shied away from close relationships with women? I'm quite 
I'll be to have a few close relationships tonight, if anybody's not spoken for. So why in the past no, what are you doing after the Joe ladies? A few close relationships. I'm all for it. Savile probably was looking for another relationship at that point. And he was even brazen enough to do it on a TV camera because we wouldn't expect anybody to do that. Nobody would be that brazen um, to ask to hook up with someone for the reasons he wanted to hook up with them on TV. This is the Jimmy Savile Road Show that they've come to know and love. I'm very weak. I can resist everything but temptation, and I, and I, I mean, I... I just... <laughs> He's got the tracksuit on, the jewellery. He's got all the patter. He's very amusing, but he doesn't actually say anything of any substance. Superficial charm is one of the things that we look for when we're assessing psychopaths. To understand the man behind the mask, Jimmy Savile's life before television, and the intensity of his relationship with his mother are revealing. Savile was born in Leeds. He was the youngest of seven. His mother, he called the Duchess. They were very, very close. During the war, he became a Bevin boy. Bevin boys were kids who were too young to fight, went down the coal mines. He comes from a very materially deprived background, but it's also an emotionally deprived background. Both of his parents were described as being quite cold and aloof. And I suspect, as the youngest of seven, that he's had to compete not only for material things, but for the attention of his parents. So I think this has contributed to this idea of it's a doggy dog world. And he was going to make sure that he was the biggest, most impressive and most aggressive dog. He did a variety of things like scrap metal dealer, he also dabbled with professional wrestling. And then rock and roll was happening and he sensed an opportunity, making a name for himself in dance halls. And it was there that he started acquiring unsavory habits. I mean, he wrote in his own autobiography about how he would chain people to chairs in the basement if they'd done something wrong and make sure they didn't do it again. Savile never married and until his mid forties, lived with his mother until her death. Is it really because you had this special relationship with your mother that you found it difficult to create other relationships with other women? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately. It would make life easy so. if I could say yes. Uh, it moves into a, a, a ground and an area where, where Savile doesn't want to go. What he's bringing into play here is another prop. A cigar gives him something else to put between him and the interviewer as a defence mechanism to give him some space. It gives him thinking time. But it would be true to say that the Duchess, mm. your mother, mm. is the only woman that you've really had a special, close relationship with. So it's taken him 10 seconds to light a cigar. In 10 seconds, he can create two paragraphs of narrative ready to play back. So it's a very, very clever technique. No, if I took a girl home while she was there, she'd sling him out if I went to the loo. <laughs> she do that, but not because she had anything going for for me as a son, but she didn't want anybody uh, nicking her life of luxury off her, so she, she'd kick him out the door a bit lively. He talks about his mother, who he calls the Duchess, as a survivor. He says that she never allowed him to have long-lasting relationships with women because she was afraid of her life of luxury being undermined. She was uh, possessive? No, not really. Not really. But she just, was frightened no, of she losing was, you? No, she was a survivor. But she was frightened of losing you? Yeah, no, no, no. What she didn't want was for me to walk in and say, hey, you know that girl I brought in last week? Yeah, well, she's going to move in here and you're going to move out. Ooh, she didn't want any of that. Out, get out. Little fixin'. So even though these two lived together and supposedly he was devoted to her, the relationship can't have been that close and that stable because she wasn't at all confident that her son wasn't going to throw her out the door. The real reason why Jimmy Savile had no serious partners was not his mother. His interest was in vulnerable people, particularly if they were very young. Once he realised what sort of establishment Duncroft was, I think he was just like a kid in a candy store. In 1973, Savile was actually invited to entertain girls who stayed at this approved school for emotionally disturbed girls in Surrey and allowed to stay overnight, supposedly in a separate wing. 
these girls were vulnerable, these girls were damaged, and he went through girl after girl after girl. You know, quite often he would choose me, I've no idea why. Forced by Savile to obey, aged 14, Cat Ward was sexually abused. I ended up fellating him because he promised me that if I did, I could go to London and be on the stage on his television show. At the time, I didn't see that as any kind of abuse. As far as I was concerned, it was reasonable payment for what he was offering. Because my mindset was that of a damaged individual. Cat Ward was Savile's guest at BBC Television Centre in West London. It was wonderful, it was great. I literally was rubbing shoulders with celebrities. He had a curtained area off on one side. He said that's where he got changed. He tended to ask you to come and sit on his knee. And you'd sit on his knee and he'd juggle his leg. Because he only wore his tracksuit without underwear, you were aware of the male parts becoming hard. And it was quite unpleasant. Savile ordered Cat Ward never to tell anyone. He had a special word for it. He would say, oh, we don't grass. Gentleman never, never tells what's passed between himself and a lady. It's a very strange phrase to use, isn't it? Because criminals use that phrase, don't they? If you grass on someone, you've told on them so that they'll get into trouble. More than 20 years later, Savile was using the same word throughout his TV interview. We have several examples of where he mentions grassing or no-grow areas. Oh, Mr. No grass here. What am I, grass? I don't grass on nobody. And I don't grass on nobody. Have you had lots of female I would hope so, because being alive a long time, I would have hoped that one would have had lots and lots of them. But, uh, but I've got remember? this terrible... Me oh, unfortunately, no, you see. I I've got this... And anyway, I'm not... I never have been a grass. And at this point, he introduces a related topic about there's no-go areas. So there are certain things which are no-go areas. Unfortunately, that is what is called a no-go area, which is a very famous phrase of mine. I'm sorry, it's a no-go area. That's right. It's a no-go area, and I don't grasp on nobody. This is someone signalling that, that he has secrets, and those secrets are no-go areas, and he won't grasp, and neither do ladies in my life grasp or people I've helped in my life. So there's emphasis on it's not just about him, it's about them behaving the way he expects them to. It's a no-go area and I don't grasp on nobody. Neither the ladies in my life or people I've helped in my life or whatever. But I'm quite prepared to talk about things as long as he's not grassing on anybody. Jimmy Savile remains in control throughout and in spite of the presenter wanting to push this towards talking about sexual relationships, Jimmy Savile has tactics that help him ensure that he maintains his no-go areas. So what he's hoping to convey is, look, I don't kiss and tell. I'm a gentleman. I've got manners. But of course, he's got no code of honour whatsoever. And the use of the word grass is actually quite a Freudian slip because it's slang for not talking about one's criminal activities. So that's much more in keeping, isn't it, with what we know about Jimmy Savile as a predatory sexual offender? I know of at least one survivor who started fundraising at one of the hospitals and that's how he spotted her and he ended up attacking her and raping her. Uh, so his charity work gave him just unlimited opportunity and access. But all survivors could do was watch as he went to Buckingham Palace and became Sir Jimmy Savile. I was absolutely steaming livid. I can remember those pictures so vividly on the telly, how smug he was. And I thought, my God, he's even taken in the royal family and the Queen. But I'd see him being trumpeted as this wonderful person, this terrific fundraiser, this selfless saint, Saint Jimmy. That's not really who he is. He's a pervert, is what he is. To hide the truth and protect his image, Savile was prepared to threaten and bully. 
there's a tabloid newspaper who were going to expose him. They had two survivors who were good, credible witnesses from the Duncroft School for Approved Children. At least two others said, I'm going to tell. And he would say, yeah, yeah, really? Go on, then. And Savile and his lawyers said, well, look, um, what you've got is two dirty slags. That's how Savile referred to them, two dirty slags who are in an approved school because they're unreliable. How's that going to play with a star-struck jury? Who's going to believe you over me? I'm world-famous, I am. I do loads for charity. Everybody loves old Jimmy. No, but, you know, you go ahead, you go and tell if you want. I have, as character references, Charles and Di, Mrs Thatcher and the Pope. So good luck with that. Um, the jury are probably going to find for me, and guess what, it'll cost your newspaper 10 million and put you out of business. Whenever a victim came forward, they weren't believed. Or even worse, they were believed. But it was brushed under the carpet because quite simply, the amount of money that he was worth to an organisation was prioritised over what that individual had been subjected to. So Jimmy Savile, through his charity work, was able to groom not just individual victims, but in actual fact, the whole organisation, or even, if you like, the whole nation. If you have a lot of money, you can use the law, justice, for your own ends to achieve some very bad stuff, and that's what the Jimmy Savile scandal teaches us, is that unscrupulous, appalling people can use the law to get away with it. Savile escaped ever being charged or even exposed. His ruthlessness and dishonesty prevailed. I tell lies when it suits me. <laughs> I've had plenty of close relationships. But like I said, Mr No Grass here. He provides um, a truth uh, that now echoes in terms of its simplicity. I tell lies when it suits me. He did lie when it suited him. Uh, and because he played it as though it was absurd, he often got away with it. So he's now got licence to lie for the rest of this interview and maybe for the rest of his life. There are liars, there are damn liars, and there are pathological liars. And Jimmy Savile is definitely a pathological liar. Now, we all tell lies from time to time, but a pathological liar tells them frequently they will lie about big things, small things, and everything in between. And they're very, very often quite proud of their ability to lie. They're not going to be embarrassed if they're caught out in a lie. I tell lies when it suits me. <laughs> He's somebody who is absolutely brazen about it, and it's all part and parcel of a pattern of behaviour that's all to do with manipulation of other people. The question that lives on, almost 10 years after Jimmy Savile's death, is how someone so famous got away with abuse and deception for so long. Have relationships and sex been hey. casual? There's this phrase, hiding in plain sight. It's often used, but that's exactly what he was doing. He mentioned the S word. He played a persona, he played a part. I don't think we ever really knew who Savile was. As a person, we knew him as a personality. And because he was such a big personality, I think you can get away with hiding in plain sight. Is it just casual? What? Sexual relationships. <laughs> what relationships? I wouldn't want to play poker with Jimmy Savile because he really is the king of the double bluff. So he says all of these strange things that if you took them in isolation, you'd think, hang on a minute, this guy's really creepy and a bit weird. But the joke is that I'm saying those things because they can't possibly be true. And that makes people laugh at him. <laughs> but the joke's on us because in actual fact, it's not very funny because it is true, but we only know that in hindsight. But the one person who may have known the truth about Savile was stopped from appearing on the show. I think the person that he has the closest relationship with is actually his secretary. Why wouldn't you let your secretary of 25 years uh, speak to us and come on the programme? He has ultimate authority in that relationship. She's not going to be able to question him in any way. That's the kind of relationship that works for him. Because secretaries 
spend their time secretarying and not grassing on their bosses. If you notice his delivery, it's very deliberate and slow. Because secretaries spend their time secretarying and not grassing on their bosses. He's telling us very emphatically that this is serious. This isn't one that is going to move an inch on. And the immediate reaction we get from Savile is a wry smile because he knows that she's not coming on the programme. This is clear from his behaviour. This is pleasure and uh, satisfaction of knowing he's controlling operations here. He probably does it so much that it prompts the presenter's next question. She knows where the secrets are. Oh, no, right? no, no, she knows nothing. Pay attention to the pitch. Oh, no, right? no, no, she knows nothing. It's higher than his baseline. Baseline being the pitch we've heard throughout the interview. So that suggests that we've got tension uh, in the throat. When the pitch increases, it's because the vocal cords are stretched. That stretching can be a secondary effect of muscle tension, which is throughout the body when we're anxious. And he adds, she knows nothing. She knows nothing. And then he doesn't want to appear a bully, so he adds a couple of complimentary sentences. She's well, lovely, she's lovely. She's lovely, she's lovely. She may not say the same about him, but it seems like that what goes on in Savile Land stays in Savile Land. The presenter pushes it a little bit more. She's a little bit scared of you, is she not? A I mean, little bit, I should hope she's a lot. But she was a lot, because... One of the ways he could have answered this was to stress, oh, no, no, she's got no need to be scared of me. That isn't where he goes. She's a little bit scared of you, is she not? A I mean, little bit, I should hope she's a lot. But she was a lot, a because... Bit. He emphasises that a little bit, the minimizer, isn't accurate. And we then get an increase in volume when he tells us, I should hope she's a lot not a little bit. So he, he uses a maximizer in replace of the minimizer. In other words, he's happy for people, especially the presenter at this point, to understand that he's very much in control and he wants the secretary to be scared of him. The delivery comes across as more serious. He's used humor throughout. This doesn't sound like humor. When This Is Your Life was uh, doing you, and yeah. you know, that's a surprise, to be a surprise, she was so scared that uh, you would be angry that she hadn't tipped you off, that she did tip you off, that you were going to appear. Everybody tipped me off about everything. He says that everybody tips him off about everything, and he's absolutely right. And in a way, he's tipping us off about that. And I think that it shows just how narcissistic he is. He wants us to know that he's got friends everywhere and just how far his tentacles reach. But it's a really unpleasant thing to say when you think about it. But again, it's just passed off as a joke. Everything that Savile says is taken with a large dose of salt. So we assume that it's harmless. Everybody tips me off about everything. Yeah, on about. Everybody tips me off about everything. Notice the language there. He's been asked specifically about the secretary. He takes it onto a whole general level. This is about everybody and knowing about everything. This is someone showing he has control and he likes to have that control. And then we end up with what can only be described as a veiled threat. Nobody wants to die young. Everybody tips me off about everything. Hang on about. Nobody wants to die young. It's so off topic, it's so disjointed from what precedes it, you're, you're left wondering, what is that meant to refer to? Is it meant to be an attempt at humour? How does it fit in with the secretary? And so I'm liking it to a veiled threat, possibly aimed at the presenter, possibly for humorous effect. Nobody wants to die young. Jimmy Savile was two days short of his 85th birthday when he died quietly in his sleep. Tributes poured in from the government, senior politicians and TV colleagues. When Jimmy Savile died, he was given what was virtually a state funeral. He was laid to rest in a gold-plated coffin in Leeds Cathedral. Thousands attended the carrying of the coffin through the streets. But now he was gone and could threaten no more. The rumours of Savile's sexual abuse soon became facts. Within a year, 30 police officers were on the case. 
Metropolitan Police are still looking at allegations with a view to launching a The has been ruined. The police are taking claims of abuse at the hands of Jim the release of investigations into 28 NHS hospitals. TV presenter, DJ. Add to that list, paedophile. They happen very, very quickly. He went from national treasure, semi-saint, to national pariah and symbol of everything that was kind of wrong with light entertainment and appalling behaviour in the 70s and 80s. The Metropolitan Police Service in London set up what's known as Operation Yew Tree to coordinate the investigation. Now, I think at the time they were expecting maybe 20, 30, 40 victims to come forward. In the end, I think well over 600 individual people came forward to tell their accounts um, of, of abuse. This is by Savile alone. Grab, grab that position about there. That's good. That's good. But there were more. Operation Utree launched successful prosecutions against TV entertainer Rolf Harris, guilty of 19 charges of indecent assault. Publicist to the stars Max Clifford, guilty of eight charges of indecent assault. And the singer Gary Glitter, guilty of rape, indecent assault, and having sex with an underage girl who kept quiet about the assault for 22 years. Savile is such an important part of British history because it was when the penny finally dropped that sex offenders don't meet these nice, neat stereotypes that we think they meet. They're not all strange loners. They can be people who are successful, powerful, well-loved. He got away with it because, as well as being an abuser, he was also entertaining to watch on TV, and he did good works for charity, and he was able to charm people. As a result of talking with me frankly about some of these things tonight, are you, have you rethought some things? Does you, are you looking back differently, or...? No, not really, not really. All I got up this morning hoping the world was a nice place, and I will go to bed tonight hoping that I haven't had to change my mind. That's just about my philosophy. There are others that he did much worse to than he did to me, and I'm sure that there's hundreds of people who sit quietly at home and think, yeah, I know, and I'm still suffering, and I'm not saying a word, because I've had enough, thank you. Jimmy, thanks for coming on and doing this interview. So Jimmy Savile is The mask never slipped completely. All I can say is that those who knew what he was really like would still see what he was really like, no matter what persona, what mask he was wearing. It was evil, pure and simple.